How does the company culture in which you work now help you become to transform from where you are to where you're called to be? That's a big question, right? And one we're exploring today on this episode of the Work Positive Podcast. Another way of thinking about becoming is developing. How well does your company culture facilitate person's development, including confidence in relationship skills? In short, emotional intelligence. My guest today is the author of Transformed, The Journey to Becoming, and is here to help us transform our work cultures to better develop one another. Welcome to the Work Positive Podcast with your host, executive coach and culture architect, Dr. Joey Fawcett. Discover strategies and tactics that work positive as Dr. Joey talks with industry leaders who create a positive work culture that attracts top talent and reduces team turnover. Discover how you can create a work positive culture that increases productivity and profits. Here's your host, Dr. Joey. Wow, Work Positive Nation, she's here. Sabine Gideon is in the Work Positive House. Sabine, welcome. I am absolutely thrilled and delighted to have you on this episode of the Work Positive Podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joey. I am thrilled and honored to be here with you today. Oh, man, it's all good. This I love all my guests, but some I love. I can't say that out loud that some I love more than others. Can I? Yeah, maybe I should <laughs> just say I just say I love all my guests. <laughs> You're going to love this episode of the Work Positive Podcast. Here's why. Hold up your latest book for us, because in the intro, I, I mentioned your other book, Transform. This is Lead Her Ship Reloaded. Give us the, um, I can't read that from here. Give, give me the subtitle off that. Yep. So it's Reimagining, Redefining, and Rehumanizing Leadership. Ooh. Let's talk about rehumanizing leadership today, shall we? Because yes. you know, that's one of my big things. That's one of the way we met was through our mutual friend, Johnny B. And, and that is putting the human back in human resources where we want to be. So what does that mean to you, rehumanizing? Yeah, great question. And so if I can just take it back to what really sparked it for me, obviously the pandemic, mm -hmm. right, was the life changing event of the century and most of our most of our lifetimes outside of 9-11, if you're old enough to remember 9-11, at least for me in my lifetime. <laughs> um, and so a couple of things, you know, have occurred since that period of time. And I focus this really on women, um, because during the pandemic, obviously, a lot of women had to exit the workforce um, because they now became school teachers. They were caretakers. You know, yeah. They were already carrying these loads that from a societal perspective, we knew, but mm. it was OK. And then women started saying, no, it's not OK. It's too right. much. Now. Right. Um, and we saw this exodus with the Great Resignation. And you know, when we we're hearing about the Great Resignation, it wasn't really clear, like, well, who's leaving? You know, I, there was hospitality, there was food service, there was everything. But when you dug into the numbers, it was a lot of women making the decision to leave because the weight that they were already carrying was heavy. Mm -hmm. Now you added all these additional responsibilities and they had to be the ones to make the tough choices. Wow. We fast forward into, you know, 2022, uh, early 2023, and the narrative started to shift away from, you know, hey, what are we going to do? Like, how do we support to, to make sure that our organizations, like we still need women in the organizations. We still want to keep the focus of advancing women throughout these organizations. But it almost it's almost like we started to regress as a society where the compassion that we had and the empathy that we had and all those pieces, mm -hmm. it started to go away. And then on top of that, if you recall, the conversation shifted, especially around competencies. What were the, you know, the core competencies for leadership now? All of the things that for, you know, decades, maybe even more than that, that women used to get dinged on, right? The compassion, the empathy, the show, like the communication, the nurturing. They were now the competencies of right. like everything. It was just like, but the appreciation for the fact that women have these natural abilities, they've been doing it this entire time mm. and never appreciated and rewarded for it or recognized for it. It was just like it was like this new this new concept. <laughs> and so I, it was twofold. Right. I wanted to let's let's look at what's happened and what's shaped 
how leadership has evolved in these last few years as a result okay. of the pandemic, but also let's support women and in, in helping them to realize that, wow, who I am, my innate skills, they matter. My competencies matter. Now, how do I take these things that, you know, I come natural to me and how do I leverage them in the organization? Because now they're important. Now they're in the spotlight. Yeah, exactly. And not only do they matter, they've been accentuated as key essential skills. Whereas before they may have been seen as you know, skills. Not a fan of this phrase, but as soft skills. <laughs> One of my other California friends, uh, not too far from you, Larry Levine, likes to say soft skills drive hard dollars. Mm -hmm. So rather than squishy or soft, which has a demeaning tone to it, I think it's my friend Lindsay Dowd who likes to talk about power skills. Let's transform soft skills and the way we think about those into power skills. And to to your point, there does seem to have been this overlooking of those innate skills, seeing them as a weakness. And now those skills, especially emotional intelligent type skills and empathy being top of the heap, right, are required by Gen Z particularly. Uh, I know you're a geriatric millennial, but but the generation that comes behind you, right? Gen Z is entering the workforce in massive numbers. They're requiring that. So let's say that I'm having a conversation. Uh, I'm seeking to attract top talent and I'm having a conversation with someone that I regard as top talent. How do I, because the attraction process is twofold, it's how positive my work culture is, and then how I represent that to someone that I'm in, I want to invite or I'm checking out to about joining the team. How do I represent, how do I communicate the fact that our company values what's previously been called soft skills and now regards them as power skills? Yeah, that's a great question. So I guess a couple ways to do that. I'll, I'll put on my recruiter hat because I, okay. I was for so, so long. It's one, what are the values of the organization, right? Because at the end of the day, like that is, I mean, I know there are companies that still have these nice little value lists that hang on the wall or they, they're on the website, but they don't live them, right? So that stuff should be reflected in the organization's values. Like that is not, you know, no one, you know, usually people are like, I'm a really nice person. Well, if you have to tell us that you're a really nice person, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps you're not. You, you know, mean it should be obvious I'm a nice person because <laughs> I act like a nice person. <laughs> right. So I start with, you know, are they part of your values? Are these, you know, compassion, integrity, growth, like courage, are these things already part of your inherent core values of the organization? Um, and can you tie back, especially if you're if it's an interview process, can you tie back how you are um, manifesting or how you're demonstrating these core values within the organization? So I used to uh, work at a credit union back in Connecticut. Okay. And what is probably the only job that I can say that I actually loved or I should say company that I loved working for. And it was because their values were reflected in their decision making. It was reflected in the people that they hired. And being the only recruiter there, I got to live and I got to embody it. So when I shared it with candidates, I meant it because it, I wasn't just drinking the Kool-Aid. I saw it every day. And wow. so their values were caring, trust, and dependability, mm. right? And caring, trust, and dependability with their members because it was community-based uh, organization with their employees. It was members first, employees first. And that you saw that in the benefits, you saw that in the way leadership communicated. And so here I am having conversations about people about like, yes, caring about human beings is what matters here. Um, trust, we have to build trust with each other. And then of course the dependability, doing what you say you're gonna do, being consistent, all of those pieces it made it so much easier for me to quote unquote sell the job or sell the company to candidates because I had examples. Mm. I had clear examples and I had already embodied the values myself and could reflect that back to them. Well, so, you know, for an organization or for someone who was thinking like, how do I do that? 
you be it. You be it in order to do it. Yeah, and that's the difference between recruiting or selling somebody on coming to your company and attracting them to you. Mm. Because if you're that way by nature, then you by nature are going to attract people. Go back, work Positive Nation, and listen to Andrew Capp's uh, interview with me about that attraction factor and how that works. Therefore, the integrity of the process, the genuineness, the authenticity that you had in representing that credit union to that top talent, you, you can't fake that. that. That's the real, real thing. Now, you used a word that's so important, I think, in attracting top talent and creating a positive work culture, and that's the word trust. How have you seen it done best, Sabine, in terms of creating trust in a positive work culture. Oh, is this when you're already in the organization? Or you're trying to attract somebody to it because they're sort of flip sides of the same coin, right? Yeah, they are, they are. So I'll I'll take it from the perspective of being inside of the organization, right? So, you know, with any relationship that we have, like a part of us being able to work together, collaborate, do all the things is there has to be a level of trust. How do you build trust, right? You do what you say you're going to do Thank when you. You have an employee who, you know, brings something to you. Do they feel comfortable where they're not going to be belittled or they're not mm. going to be reprimanded if there's been a mistake made? Mm. Um, when you're in the presence of your peers, you know, even as a leader, you're not in a leadership perspective. You know, are you backbiting and are you talking about your colleague or, you know, are you sharing information? So it's, it's the day to day of how we're showing up. That's how we build trust. And you know it. People are always watching. Whether they say anything to you or not, people are always watching. Mm -hmm. And so all you have to do is, you know, break the trust or all you have to do is do something that is untrustworthy, whether that means, you know, you told somebody else's business or, you know, you you lied about like your, your chart or whatever the case may be. And that breaks trust. When it comes to leaders and employees, I think that that is the piece where, unfortunately, I don't blame leaders. It's not something that most organizations invest in training or upskilling their Mm -hmm. managers on how to build trust. You've seen it, right? Oh, you're a great individual contributor. You're a top performer. (laughs) We're going to make you a manager now. Congratulations. Go figure it out. (laughs) Here's your bonus. Here's your title. And maybe here's your office. (laughs) And these core fundamental things, especially when you're individual contributor and you're, you know, you're with your peers Mm -hmm. and now you become the manager and now you're managing your peers. Right. Mm -hmm. We talk about that identity shift that happens of being doer going from delegator or I'm sorry, from going from doer to delegator. Yep. We talk about all these other pieces of, you know, it's not about you getting the credit. It's about your team. But fundamentally, what are some of the core things? Like if you were a certain way with your peers and maybe they didn't have trust in you, now you've stepped into that place. How do you proactively build that trust? Hmm. Your title does not automatically warrant you trust. Not anymore. Mm-mm. No. And and there really needs to be a consistency of your doing what you say you're going to do yeah. or communicating if you see you're going to fall short of delivering in the time frame or there's some extenuating circumstances, communicating that to the person that makes an additional trust deposit in their emotional bank and says to them, okay, Sabine cared about me enough to say, hey, Dr. Joey, we're not going to make it by Friday, but how about next Tuesday? Would that work? Uh, You don't necessarily have to explain it. You just have to say, you know, give that heads up. Now, I mean, if you want to offer an explanation, that's fine. That's up to the depth of your relationship. The consistency of doing what you say you're going to do. That's what I hear you talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And it also it starts with us. And I, I, I do a lot of uh, focus on self-awareness because I feel like from us, everything we do is emitted out into the world. Magnified. And I, yeah, I have the saying, you know, how you do things one way is how you do things every way. Right. And people don't always necessarily connect the dots. So when I'm I'm a big list, here's something as small. I'm a big list maker, right? So first thing in the morning or most of the time, like I'll make this list of 10 things that I want to do, okay. right? 
let's just say I go months. I list out 10 things that I'm going to do every day, but I only get to three. I only get to four. What I've trained myself and what I've trained my own subconscious is that I don't trust myself enough to get the stuff that I need to get done because I have not met the commitment to myself every mm. single day. Mm. I guarantee you in that path with that pattern of the example, there are other things where I might say, oh, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll get you that proposal. Or I'll get you that task. Or I'll get you da da da. And then it doesn't happen. Why? Right. Because I have a habit of not doing what I said I'm going to do, even when it's just me and I'm the only one accountable. Mm. So this is what the self-awareness comes into play. How are you being? How are you showing up when mm. no one's watching, when no one's holding you accountable? That's what's going to reflect in your day to day. So if people don't trust you or you have difficulty building that trust with others, look at your the trust that you built with yourself. Mm. And if I'm untrustworthy with myself, of course, I'm not going to be trustworthy with you, right? Because uh, I, I hopefully love myself enough to be good to myself. Sabine Gideon is my guest on this episode of the Work Positive Podcast. You can go to right now, SabineGideon.com, and you can discover all sorts of great stuff. Sabine will tell us more about what's on her site in just a few minutes. Or if you want to go to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, whatever your favorite bookseller is. Her latest book is Lead Her Ship reloaded that's great so i've attracted top talent i've emphasized trustworthiness to them i've given them examples of how we are who we say we are right mm -hmm. so the way i tell you we roll is the way we roll how do i stop the revolving door how do i reduce team turnover sabine yeah so we can look at that in many different capacities so at the time of this recording right when you look at the workforce today uh, 20 percent are boomers, 70 or so between 30 something uh, Gen X, Gen uh, Y, and then Gen Z is about 5 percent. While Gen Z is about 5 percent right now, about 50 percent of them are recorded that they're op not opting to go into your traditional work environments. So you have your boomers, 20 percent. It's estimated that in 2030. Uh, most of them will be out of the workforce. So that is a large population, especially for some industries. Then you have Gen Z where, yes, they are the new workforce, but they're not opting into coming into your organization. Or if they do and they, they get a whiff of inauthenticity or lack of the humanization, they are leaving. Right. So for, before we even get to like, how do we stop the revolving door? Let's look at what is our population, right? Mm -hmm. Like what's happening within our organization? And so a lot of organizations, they are, I shouldn't say a lot, but several <laughs> have gotten <laughs> smart in saying, you know what, this isn't just about, you know, whether or not we or are hybrid or we're catering to our employees or anything like that. We need people and we need to value people a lot more. Mm -hmm. So for the people who are leaving, meaning like the boomers who are, are retiring, organizations are put implementing strategies like the boomerang strategy, right? So that's where they are bringing them back as consultants, maybe part time. But at the same time, the smart ones are aligning them with the Gen Zers, like as buddies or as mentors, giving mm -hmm. these boomers an opportunity to train, to develop. Obviously, it's to maintain the institutional knowledge, but also to give them a sense of fulfillment in terms of being able to train and develop. And then it gives Gen Z the opportunity to work with seasoned professionals. So that's a strategy. I think this, especially in this world that we live in right now with mm -hmm. hybrid or remote work, while it offers a lot of flexibility and we can still be productive, the people side of it, the having someone that you know, someone that you can go to, someone who is a confidant, mm -hmm. that is what the organizations who have been on the cycle, they think going back to the office is going to is going to solve this. Going back to the office is not going to solve this. You're mm -hmm. going to have turnover. Mm -hmm. People fact. who are spending all this time at work, they want they want relationship at work. They want meaningfulness at work. Like they don't want to be another cog in the wheel. They don't want it to just be about, oh, I come here, I get my paycheck. Gen Z is all about working to live, not living to work as right. previous generations. So right. recognizing that no work doesn't have to be, you know, ping pong tables and, you know, lunch every day or anything like that. But when they come there, does anyone know their name? Or when they're out, does anyone recognize that they're missing? 
Mm, mm, Those yeah. aspects of like, okay, we are we are a team. We are collaborating. Mm. We're together. We know each other to an extent. Obviously, you want to be professional. Um, sure. That's the way to to stop the bleeding. At least this time in the season that we're in right now, and what's to come. Yeah, and and that highlights the need for two things at Gen Z. Uh, are seeking outside of traditional work, right? And that's belonging and becoming. Mm -hmm. They want to belong. I want to know how the task that I'm doing each day contribute to my team and then how my team contributes to the mission, vision, and values of the company, you know, and how we roll around here. Am I doing it in a way that, that is commensurate with that and aligns well with it? And the other thing about the becoming, how do I grow, to your point, how do I grow my skill set, take my strengths and add skills to those strengths so that I'm continuing to develop the personal professional, uh, that dichotomy is artificial today, particularly with Gen Z and rightfully so. I'm a whole person. So how do I grow? Now, in terms of the boomerangs and coming back mentoring, here's a great opportunity for Gen Z to reverse mentor, right? The people in my generation are coming back in, particularly with the the advance of, uh, I like to call it augmented intelligence instead of artificial intelligence, because we're all augmented in some way these days. So the question is, how are you going to be augmented? So through the augmented intelligence and Gen Z then increases their sense of belonging and understand themselves as contributing to someone else's becoming. Because when I ask, how can I help? And people are more likely to want to help me, right? So the reverse mentoring from Gen Z to, to boomers increases the satisfaction and engagement of the boomers. And it's not just a top down. Both sides are coachable. And from where I'm sitting, that's the greatest challenge today in creating a positive work culture. Would you agree with that, Sabine? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And something you said sparked the conversation about trust for me to go back to that, you know, growing in corporate, right? You know, the performance review process, right? If somebody yes. wanted somebody wanted a raise or they wanted a promotion or, you know, they wanted to know where they sit on the talent review and the succession planning, it would be like, oh, well, you know, you're you're two years, you have two year runway or whatever the case may be. Yeah. We used to get these very arbitrary things of like, these are the things that you need to work on, but they weren't ever very specific, right? Mm -hmm. When you think about building trust, especially with Gen Z, they are great models of this. When they come to their managers and say, hey, what do I need to do to get to the next level? Like they're looking for a roadmap. And what is no longer okay is the, well, you know, you just need to be in the role for a little while. <laughs> or if you're told, you know what, if you build on X number of skills and da, 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 then you'll get the promotion. How many of us can say that we did all the things and still didn't get the promotion? Yeah. You want to yeah. trust if you tell someone, these are the things, this is the pathway, this is what you need to do. And someone comes and says, I've done all these things and they don't get the yeah. promotion a quick way to lose that trust. Yeah. And there's a different conversation and providing that person with a Sherpa or a mentor to say, here are the development opportunities we have available to you mm -hmm. to add this skill onto that strength. And thank you for declaring it. And then you put together a PDP, a personal professional development plan, right? And you involve a coach and then you just begin to layer after layer after layer. That's an investment in an individual that pays huge dividends to the company. Yeah. You'll get the loyalty. You'll get the dedication. You'll get the work <laughs> done. Yeah. Um, but more importantly, as you know, it, it's it's costly to acquire employees um, oh, yeah. or, or even, you know, try to backfill. Especially right. now. Cost you 10 to 12 times that person's annual salary. Yeah. And about those performance evaluations, it's got to be more than once every six months or every year. There needs to be a constant reinforcement of desired behaviors. And here's how we do that. And um, there's some amazing ways to do that that unfortunately we don't have time to talk about today. <laughs> but next conversation we have, we'll definitely talk about those. So Sabine Gideon, when I go to your website, it's SabineGideon.com. By the way, that is in uh, the show notes. So feel free to go right there and click it if you're walking the dog or on the Peloton or something working out. Uh, what are we going to find when we go to SabineGideon.com? Yeah, so pretty much everything. My 
social media, you'll find that there. I have a blog that has not been updated for a while, but it's there, yeah. um, as well as resources. And of course, a uh, link to my podcast, She Leads Now, uh, which we have this discussion, but from the lens of women and women in leadership. Mm. Um, but uh, men can listen to it too. There's nothing that we talk about there that that is uh, exclusive of men. It just is focused on women. Oh, I love that. I love that. And so is LinkedIn a great way to reach out to you, Sabine? It is the best way. It is my hangout spot. And you can yeah. find me there. The handle is, is Sabine Gideon, all one word. Wonderful. I think that's how you and I got connected was through LinkedIn because we we were doing some hangouts and and around some of the same places. And hey, there's Sabine Gideon. I want to talk to her. And and your book Lead Hership is available through your website. Is it also available at Amazon and B and N? It is Amazon. I don't know if it's on Barnes and Nobles, but definitely okay. Amazon and paperback and Kindle. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So Work Positive Nation always wants to know from my guests, Sabine Gideon, so I've got to ask you, and I can't wait to hear your answer. What's one thing? So Sabine Gideon, what's your one thing Work Positive Nation can do starting today to create a positive work culture? Yeah, I'm going to go with the the self-awareness piece, right? And this is something that I've been challenging my my leaders for with for the last almost two years now. Answer the question, who am I? And be able to answer that question and and do the work, right? Like, this is not just like, oh, who am I? Um, But ask yourself, who am I? And when you ask yourself, who am I? After you've stripped away the titles, the roles, you know, everything that you play, get down to the core of who you really are. Because when you can answer that question, then it will show you how you are showing up and what you're putting out into into the world. And if by chance you get to the point where you're kind of like, I don't know the answer to that question, you're in a good place because now you get to create what that answer is going to be. And I hope and pray that you are creating a positive uh, image or a positive uh, being that has a ripple effect on the earth. Mm. Sabine Gideon, I love you. And I thank you for what you're doing to spread that love around the earth uh, you obviously have created an amazing person from yourself. And I'm I'm just going to celebrate Sabine Gideon today, Work Positive Nation. Thanks. It's a privilege and an honor to have you on this podcast. And I look forward to more in future conversations with you. I'm here, Dr. Joey. Thank you so much for having me and sharing me with your audience. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Work Positive Podcast. Please share this podcast with your friends who are HR and small business leaders so they can do one thing today to create a positive work culture that increases productivity and profits. I'd like to give you a free work positive course just for listening. It's called Something to Talk About, and it's transformed the work conversations of so many people all over the world. Get your free copy when you go to workpositive.today slash something to talk about, and you can start transforming your conversations today. Remember, it pays to work positive.